one of the things with these uh, these kinds of developments is the more intensive the land system, the more livings that there can be extracted from this because it can st actually start to be quite a people intensive system. And that's where, you know, some of our agricultural uh, land or planning laws need to sort of uh, understand that potential. That if we want to recover our landscapes from the uh, decimation that they've had um, over time, then we need to um, actually bring people back out into the landscapes and allow that to happen. At the moment, you know, the planning laws really make it difficult for us to... Um, to uh, to bring people back into the landscape, unless they're ostensibly wage slaves, um, so who have no connect, as opposed to you know they're there as a dependent trying to get a check. Yeah. So um, yeah, this this would be uh, this is pretty easy stuff. Not that big an investment. Um, incremental in the way that it can be developed. You know, if I was going to develop it, I'd concentrate on building one here first so that I could um, work on my better parts of land first because you can get the greatest possible effect for the least possible change. You know, once we get down into these landscapes, we've got deeper soil, better soil. The only thing that's often missing is water. Now, some people will get the water from underground now, um, that underground water could be very, very old indeed and, um, and you know, is a declining resource wherever we go. We were over in the Kuyama River Valley and they're down to over 1,000 feet in a lot of locations now. Um, so that uh, is not sustainable, obviously. It, well, that is, that is your water. In fact... Um, this state is going to need to look at very seriously its water situation, particularly in how it respects rainwater. Um, to, to not allow uh, you to get a permit to build a dwelling or to, to live in a dwelling without, without having a well is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my life, especially coming from a nation of rainwater harvesters where on every house in rural Australia, we have a rainwater tank which harvests water off the, off the roof. For one, as my friends had to do, they had to spend $25,000 building a well 400 feet deep that's going to require energy to continue to lift that out. Um, so fossil energy to continue to pump that water out. It's got lots of dissolved solids. It's not exactly fantastic water. Um, and then they've got to spend about another $6,000 plumbing it into their house. As opposed to spending about $5,000 on building a rainwater tank and they would have all of the potable water that they needed. And, you know, if they were concerned about the, about the potability of that water, well, then it's just a matter of putting some filtration on it. There's more than enough carbon filters, UV filters... We have all of the technology that we need in order to make um, rainwater, even polluted rainwater, very, um, very uh, safe and potable. There's the potential as well for, with especially uh, in horticultural areas, for groundwater pollution from mobile pesticides and herbicides, etc. Um, I believe that in uh, Florida that um, one of the main groundwater pollutants is a, is a herbicide called simazine. Now, simazine is used as a pre-emergent herbicide. So it uh, locks onto clay particles in the soil and then it prevents the, um, the germination of, uh, of, of seeds, sprout, sprouting of seeds that might compete with your crop. As an antidote to having to continue to use a knockdown herbicide like glyphosate or uh, Roundup, as it's better known. Now, that herbicide is only effective if there's clay in the soil where it can actually lodge on. If there's none of that, as with a lot of our horticultural areas, which are uh, sandy loam soils from the deposition of um, sand, sandstone uh, um, hills and limestone hills, etc., we have sandy loam over clay or just deep sands. 
And uh, obviously, there's nothing to hold on to that. And uh, it becomes mob mobile, gets into the, into the groundwater. So, I mean, to me, I think that the best thing that we can do with groundwater is actually leave it alone. Um, it's a well overused resource in this country and uh, rainwater is a radically underutilised resource in this country. Every house should have a rainwater tank. You can do things like this. You can also um, do things like key lime ploughing. If you, say if we weren't allowed to build any of these ponds, <laughs> which is quite possible, I think we're still allowed, allowed to plant trees and I think we're still allowed to, um, to cultivate um, so just by using uh, something like a key, yeoman's key lime plough or um, its um, analogues, we can um, basically work the ground on a um, slightly falling contour, like fall out towards the ridge from the valley and enable, therefore, the water that falls to infiltrate into the, into the ground or when it re it's really heavy to actually move away from the valley out towards the ridge, therefore rehydrating the ridges. So uh, that's another very powerful um, thing that we can do. This that we see here had its infancy about nearly 60 years ago. So we've got systems in Australia that have been going for, you know, 50 odd years. My family farm had this system for until the family farm was sold uh, in 2002. The system was built in the 1950s and worked perfectly well, all by gravity, all by rainfall. And it meant that we didn't need to get a farm that was bigger. And we had options and we were drought proof and we were fire proof because that's the other thing that other reason why Yeomans developed this system. In 1943, his brother-in-law was killed by a bushfire. So that stimulated, you know, the need to drought-proof his landscape was one thing. The other thing was that uh, he could, with all of these ponds, in the event of a fire, just open the valves and flood his whole landscape. And in doing so, removed any potential for fire at all. California, South Africa, Southeastern Australia, Southwestern Australia are all the most fire prone parts of the, of the world. Oh, and Provence, Spain, Mediterranean climates, those brittle climates. So there's, there's, uh, there's no reason in any of those places where, where we couldn't do this kind of thing. Yeah. And then, because most of these foothills are where the humans are habitating. Um, it's only up into the mountains where uh, we find uh, it difficult to, to build these kinds of systems, um, and nor we should. And fire might be part of a natural regime there anyway. So, but at least in our valuable areas where humans are habitating, we, fire is something that we can prevent. You know, from the very point of putting in um, tree belts which are um, non-flammable, um, from pruning our trees so that we have clean stems which are not flammable or not as flammable, um, from us um, harvesting um, or mulching the uh, residue of our prunings from trees um, so that they are not so flammable, from selecting species that don't have flammable leaves. You know, there's a whole range of different strategies and then we put on another layer of that that if we are irrigating pastures through summer, then they are going to be green and uh, they don't burn. So we have a layer, layers of uh, ameliorative, ameliorative strategies to overcome fire.